everybody and welcome to this Stronger Together Get Together and it's the 27th uh, Get Together which is quite phenomenal to think that we've been, we've been um, in this fab community for almost three years so it's so lovely to see familiar faces and to welcome new people along today as well as so welcome to you all and many of those 27 sessions are, have been recorded and are on YouTube so do pop over and have a look um, in most recently we looked at digital marketing and how we can improve that um, we've also looked at how to make business success inevitable uh, how to have a healthy relationship with your finances and business owners in the group have also shared their top tips to um, that they found really help their businesses so you can see um, the videos sharing top tips as well so do pop over and have a look it's a huge resource that's free available to everybody so do make the most of it and it's you know great to have all these resources and to run our own businesses but if we don't have energy then we are going to struggle to do what we want to do and I know that I wake up full of great ideas and um, things that I want to achieve during the day and as the day goes on my energy levels really wane and as I've got older my energy levels have really decreased as well and I find that if my energy is low then my mood can often be low I find it difficult to um, handle things as well as I'd like to can't problem solve as well um, and my creativity decreases and all of this um, is really impacts or can impact running a business, of course. So I decided to invite the fabulous Victoria Wright here today to share how we can increase our energy levels naturally. And Victoria is a self-proclaimed science geek. And she actually has three degrees, one in physics, one in herbal medicine, and one in a PhD in particle physics as well. She is um, a practicing a herbalist, practicing, practicing herbalist, and she helps so many people increase their energy levels and just have much improved lives. So I'm absolutely delighted that Victoria is here today to share how we can increase our energy levels naturally. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Victoria. So just consider for a moment, if you had all the energy that you could ever possibly need and want, how would you feel? What sort of things would you do? Would you change your life? Stick in the chat box if you've got any initial thoughts. It'd be great to hear what you would what you would think. I'd love to hear some comments. Yeah. Is there something that you would change about what you're doing now? I can see some people typing. <laughs> I haven't got any comments. Ah, uh, there we go. Better bedtimes. Is that earlier bedtimes? What does better mean? Earlier bedtimes. Great. Healthier eating. Excellent. Also a good one. More time for yourself. Consistently eating well. More water. All little, little things that you can make tiny changes on. So we'll come on to some of those in a moment. Think of, yeah, sorry, I'm having slide issues today. Now, I'm assuming that if you don't feel like that right now, that that's why you're here and that something needs to change. But as I've mentioned, you know, making big changes isn't always sustainable, but you can make tiny changes and they can have a massive effect. Right. The first thing I'm going to talk about is exercise. Now, this may be counterintuitive when you're tired, but actually research suggests that if you exercise regularly, you can, in, in fact, increase your energy levels. In fact, there was a study that analysed 70 different research studies on exercise and found that 90% 90, 90 of those studies showed the same thing. People who completed a regular exercise program reported improved fatigue 
compared to those that didn't exercise. Now, why is that? Well, exercise does a number of things. It increases your endorphin levels. And these are the natural hormones that get released when we're doing something that requires a burst of energy. And that gives us a feeling of euphoria, which is commonly known as the runner's high. But it does other things as well. It improves our cardiovascular health, so our heart health, which means that you it allows you to have greater endurance throughout the day. And when it's easier for, for you to do your daily activities, you'll have more energy left over and you know, you won't feel so tired when your work is done. Also, again, counterintuitively, exercise actually allows you to get a better night's sleep. And they found that actually um, people who, who undertake 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week, that's just 20 minutes a day of exercise, actually reported that they um, had higher quality sleep and they didn't suffer with insomnia. So it's a really important thing to consider having in your day. Now, I want to talk about a client of mine called Paula. She came to see me with chronic fatigue. Now, when I said making tiny changes can have a big impact, I really do mean it. Paula was at the point where she was thinking about giving up work because she just couldn't function anymore. And we started a program where she committed to doing two minutes of exercise every single day. So she was gonna go for a walk outside, just walk for two minutes and then come back and take a rest. And over the course of a number of weeks, and it was very slow progress, she built that up to five minutes and then to 10 minutes. And gradually she was at a point where she was walking for 30 minutes every single day and she was having more energy levels and she was able to continue and complete a full day's work. So have a think about what can you commit to do? Even if it's just a five minute walk outside, can you think about something that you can do to improve increase the, the amount of exercise or physical activity that you have in your every single day. Now, are you a night owl or a morning lark? So do you stay, are you more productive when you get up, you get up raring to go and you just tippity type in and you get on and you do lots of work and you feel really effective? Or do you prefer staying up late at night, the world's gone to bed and you are actually doing loads of really productive work and it's midnight and you're thinking I should have gone to bed but I'm really in the flow we've got some morning people Lorna's a morning person um, what else lots of morning people oh we've got night owls some night owls neither well don't worry Denise I will talk about why you're neither in a moment so it's not actually just as simplistic as being a night owl or a morning lark, but our energy levels do vary throughout the day and how it varies depends on our chronotype. Now, what's a chronotype, I hear you ask? So let's take a step back and think about circadian rhythm. Your circadian rhythm is your brain's sleep-wake cycle. So it's the thing that determines when you wake up, when you go to sleep over a 24-hour period. It's your internal clock that your brain uses to signal when to release certain hormones. But researchers have found that actually everybody's circadian rhythm is slightly different. I remember when I was back at school, one of my best friends at school, she just could never ever make it to school on time. She couldn't get there before 11 o'clock in the morning and she was always in trouble. She just had a completely different circadian rhythm. And we call these differences chronotypes. Now, there's a great sleep researcher who's come up with a theory, a structure of different chronotypes um, based on a number of different animals. And he reckons that we, we loosely fall into these categories. So Denise, look out for the category that you fall into. The first I want to talk about is the bear. And most people are bears. They get up with the sun, they have no difficulty sleeping, they have a peak of activity mid-morning, but they may have a slump mid-afternoon. They have a real steady energy to get things done. And they may can, can maintain productivity for as long as 
for all day as long as they don't push past this mid-morning, mid-afternoon slump. So they take time to recharge during this period. Lions, on the other hand, are a bit more like your lark. So lions wake up early. They're productive, most productive before lunch, but because they're so busy in the mornings, they tend to fizzle out early evening and they really like to go to bed early. Wolves are at the other end of the spectrum. So wolves start late and they actually are really more productive and they're really more efficient when the rest of the world's winding down and going to bed. Interestingly, wolves have two peak periods. So between noon and 2 p.m. and then again, sort of five, six and later in the, into the evening. And then finally, there's the dolphin. The poor old dolphin doesn't have a regular sleep routine at all. They're really light sleepers. They wake fre frequently throughout the night and they often feel like they're not getting enough sleep. They do their best work between mid morning through to early afternoon. Now, when I'm talking about best work and productivity, what I'm talking about is specifically analytical tasks. So if you need to sit in front of a spreadsheet, if you need to do something that requires a lot of analytical type of concentration, then you want to think about doing these during your peak times. Actually, what they found is that we're most creative outside of our peak times. So if you want to write something or paint something or do something that requires more creative energy, then thinking about that outside of your peak time. So have a think. What animal are you? Stick some animals in the chat uh, while I just talk about Julia, who is a really lovely client of mine. So Julia came to see me when lockdown started and everybody was working from home and she had a team and most of her team, she found, were wanting to work early in the morning. So because they weren't commuting to work every day, they wanted to start at seven o'clock in the morning, right even as early as seven o'clock in the morning. And she tried to adjust her working hours so that she could be there for them and found that this was completely misguided and she was perpetually fuzzy. So she realized that actually she's a wolf. And when she set her working hours to be between 9.30 and 5.30, she found that it not only worked better for her, but it actually worked better for a team as well. So she found that there were things that people wanted from her early in the morning. So things, small tasks, meetings, and the big meaty tasks that required her concentration, she could do in the early afternoon when all of her morning larks were actually flagging and they'd sent all of the input to her. So she was ended up to have a situation where everybody was more productive. So we've got some bears, some wolves, um, quite a few bears amongst you. Um, so just have a think about See if you can look at where your most productive times are. Where do you feel like you're more in flow, like you've really got it? And what tiny changes can you make to the structure of your day in terms of the tasks that you assign for each of those periods so that you feel like you have more energy and the right sort of energy when doing them? The final thing of my three things that I'm going to talk about is food. Now, I know food is really, really boring. Everybody talks about diet and we get a little bit fed up of talking about food. But actually, it's so important when it comes to our energy levels and it is one of the easiest ways to boost it. So I'm going to start with some general tips and then I'm going to talk about some specific issues. Now. When energy is an issue, it's better to eat little and often. Now, the reason why is this reduces the perception of fatigue, but it also gives your body a steady supply of nutrients. So some people feel sluggish just a few hours after food, and it doesn't, but it doesn't take much actually to feed your brain. So just have a piece of fruit or a few nuts, um, 
And if you find that you get an afternoon slump, then think about actually reducing the size of the meal that you eat at lunchtime and just having a small light meal. If you're dieting and a lot of people are thinking about their weight at the moment and you're suffering for fatigue, then honestly, it's the worst thing that you can do. Now, that doesn't mean not making healthier choices if you want to lose weight, but it, do it slow and steadily. So don't think about diets that make you reduce your calorie intake to below 1200 calories for a woman or 1500 for a men. This is a really bad idea if you have low energy levels. And then another thing, and I've realized that I left my glass of water downstairs, I went to top it up before the meeting, um, stay hydrated. Um, actually, if your body's short on fluids, one of the first signs is feeling fatigue. So really do you know, grab a glass of water, have one on your desk, take drinks regularly and really stay hydrated. Yep. Water is so important, Helen. Definitely think about drinking more. And dieting does put stress on the body. Completely agree. It's better to make tiny changes to your diet. Now, there are a couple of specific things that can cause fatigue. And iron deficiency anemia is one of them. Now, this occurs when there aren't enough red blood cells to meet the body's need for oxygen. And when these cells um, don't carry enough of a protein called hemoglobin. So fatigue is actually the first sign of iron deficiency anemia. Now, the first step is to think about shoring up your body's iron supplies with iron rich foods. Um, apologies to all, your, all the vegetarians and vegans on the call, but red meat is the most efficient way to boost your iron level. Broccoli and spinach do come a close second, but actually, if you're suffering from iron deficiency anemia, it really is red meat. Um, other foods are also a good source of iron. Other meats, beans, apricots are also really important for iron deficiency. But actually getting a blood test to understand if you do have iron deficiency anemia is really important. Another important um, vitamin or vitamin and mineral in those categories is vitamin B12. So sticking with the blood, red blood cells, your body needs sufficient B12 in order to produce healthy red blood cells. So actually a deficiency in, in B12 can also cause anemia and can um, also cause iron deficiency anemia. So understanding that balance between B12 and iron is really important. Now, again, the main sources of B12 from a dietary perspective are meat and dairy products. So most people get enough from diet alone. However, as you get older, it's harder for your body to absorb B12. And there are also some illnesses, for example, inflammatory bowel disease that can actually impair absorption of B12. If you are a vegetarian or a vegan, then it's an important factor to consider um, because many become iron defi uh, B12 deficient. So it's one of the vitamins that I would actually recommend supplementing if you are thinking about taking on a more vegetarian or vegan type diet. Um, just picking up the question about herbal teas. Yes, herbal teas are great. Um, they will rehydrate you fantastically and they'll keep you warm in this cold weather as well. Now, it's very, very rarely when I can say that eating chocolate is the best thing for you. And if you have seen any of my newsletter or posts, you'll know that I love chocolate. But actually, fatigue caused by magnesium deficiency, chocolate's a great solution. Um, it's actually really overlooked as a cause of fatigue but it's estimated that 2% of people in the Western diet and who eat a Western diet actually have it. It's particularly common in women, um, more so than men. So nuts and seeds are a great dietary source of magnesium, but so is 70% chocolate. So um, having a square a day definitely would put that on the list of things to do. It's a good thing and it's a nice treat too. Um, Supplementing in terms of magnesium, 
I wouldn't necessarily recommend because you can't absorb it as readily. It's quite difficult to get a supplement that you can uh, absorb. But things like um, Epsom salt baths, magnesium spray is kind of useful. Yes, uh, Julie, um, it, ca it can be absorbed. But actually, I would just go for an Epsom salt bath. Um, really lovely and relaxing once a week or a couple of times of week, a week. And, and actually, you, you'll absorb quite a lot of magnesium through the skin. Now, I want to talk about carbs. Carbs have a pretty bad reputation these days, but not all carbs are equal. So let's split into two. We've got refined carbs, so your white bread, white rice, sugar. These all give us an energy spike, but then very soon afterwards, you'll feel a slump um, as your blood sugars plummet. So then you have the complex carbohydrates. So think whole grains, wholemeal bread, brown rice, oats, all of these things are more complex carbohydrates. So they have more complex chemical structure. And that means that they break down in the body slower and they release, release the sugars. So the things you need to feel energy over a much slower time scale, meaning that you feel fuller for longer. But also it means that you have a steady flow of energy. Just want to talk about another patient of mine, Rosa. Rosa came to see me Oh, must have been one. She was one of my first clients, actually, a really, really lovely lady. And she had menopause issues and we treated it herbally. Um, but she still found that she was suffering with low energy. She was feeling nauseous. She didn't really have much of an appetite. And because she wasn't really eating, she was losing weight. Now, all of those red flags. So they definitely need investigating. And she was usually a really, really active woman, but she'd really lost her zest for life. And so we looked at what else was going on, what she was eating. We got some tests done and actually found that it was a magnesium deficiency. So as soon as she started improving her diet, she started having some Epsom salt baths. She got her magnesium le levels into a normal range. She noticed that all of those symptoms improved the menopause issues were also improving as well. And consequently, she was feeling like she was really wanted to live again. And it was just such a fantastic thing to see. Actually, she just came alive. And just a simple thing as magnesium deficiency. So have a little think. I've talked a lot about diet. Is there one thing in your diet that you could change? Now, I'm not talking about making wholesale changes. I'm really not. You know, if I was to tell you to change all of your diet right now, the chances are you might do it for a week if you were lucky and then it would just go and you'd fall by the wayside. So if you eat a lot of white bread or pasta or white rice, can you swap them out for a whole grain option? If you eat too much sugar, can you think about what can you replace that sugar with? So, you know, could you have some nuts or raisins, or no, not so much raisins, they're high sugar, but um, some nuts or seeds instead. And even if they're covered in chocolate in the short term, just to get your tastes changing, that might be a good thing. Um, you know, just trying to think of other examples. Replacing things such as, you know, if you reach for a sh sugary snack, think, can I have a piece of fruit instead? Don't say I'm not going to have the sugary snack, but actually um, have the piece of fruit and then see if you still want the sugary snack afterwards. Currently eating less bread, also need to drink more water. Go with all of that. How can you set a timer or something to prompt you to drink a bit more water? Tiny, tiny changes, but they can have a huge, huge impact. Now, before I go any further, I just want to talk about whether or not there's something else going on for, that's a cause of low energy. Um, in terms of the question about refined dried fruit better because it's not refined sugar, in a way, yes, but also it still has the potential to spike blood sugar levels. So I would actually go for whole fruits rather than dried because the concentration of sugars within the dried fruits. Um, when it comes to thinking about um, 
energy levels specifically. There, there may be other times when you want to eat dried fruits, but from an energy point of view, I would, wouldn't. Um, let's talk about other things that might be going on. Now, this isn't to scare you, um, but it is just to, it's a really important consideration. And it's important that if you have tried all of these things and you're still finding that you're suffering with poor, with fatigue or low energy, then it's really worthwhile getting a health check. There are a number of underlying medical conditions that can cause fatigue, lung problems, kidney disease, inflammatory bowel disease, endometriosis and other hormone hormone related conditions, multiple sclerosis, all have perimenopause as well. I sort of lumps that under um, hormone related conditions, um, but they can all have an impact on your energy levels. So really do consider them and get checked out. Now, there are two that I want to talk about specifically. Um, the first is um, having an underactive thyroid. So the thyroid gland is a little butterfly shaped gland in the neck, just in front of the windpipe. Um, and its main function is to produce hormones that regulate the body's metabolism. So the processes that turn food into energy. Um, hypothyroidism is a condition where the thyroid gland doesn't produce an, enough of these of some crucial hormones. And one of the first signs is actually fatigue and weight gain. So we may just attribute it to just getting older. You know, we start noticing, oh, I've put a bit more weight on or oh, I'm feeling a bit tired. And But as our metabolism continues to slow, you may start to actually develop some more obvious um, problems such as dry skin, puffy face, constipation, hoarse voice. These are all signs of hypothyroidism. Unfortunately, there are also signs or some of them are signs of perimenopause as well. So understanding what's going on, getting appropriate blood tests and really understanding whether or not you do need support for hypothyroidism if you're trying lots of things and it's not working. Another one which has been really topical when I first wrote these, this talk, it wasn't really a thing, but post-viral fatigue, everybody's heard of long COVID these days, which is a form of po post-viral fatigue. And experts aren't really sure why some viruses lead to post-viral fatigue. It may be related to an unusual response to the virus that can remain latent in the body. It may be an increased level of something called pro-inflammatory cytokines, which promote inflammation in the body. There are a number of different reasons, but there are things that you can do about it. Herbal medicine is really effective actually for, for treating post-viral fatigue. So if you are struggling just to have that oomph to get out of bed of the morning and you know that you're looking after yourself in all the right ways and you know that there isn't anything underlying going on, then actually considering this as an option might be one thing to do. So, right, I've thrown lots and lots of stuff at you. We're going to take just a little short break in me throwing things at you um, where I want you to think about what tiny change you're going to make. And now, think, making changes, as I've already said, it's easy to know what to do, but thinking about how you're going to do that is really important as well. And it being simple doesn't necessarily mean that it's easy. So I'm sure you've been on webinars like this before where you've got loads of ideas and you've written them all down and you've taken lots of notes and you're like, yay, I'm going to do all of this stuff and then nothing happens because actually real life gets in the way. But you know what? That's absolutely okay and it's perfectly normal. So instead of going and leaving this talk going, oh, I'm going to do all of this stuff, maybe just commit to one thing, one tiny thing, and then actually really commit to it. So I'm going to hold, I said to Julia when we spoke about this, I'm going to hold you all to it. So I really would like you to share the one tiny thing that you'd like to do, tiny change that you're going to make based on this talk. And stick it in the chat and we will 
Emma's going to drink more herbal tea. That's fantastic. Drinking more water. Lots of good. More hydration is definitely good. Have we got anything other than drinking more water? Reduce refined carbs and sugar. Excellent. How are you going to do that specifically? Checking out magnesium intake is a good one. 10 minute yoga stretch. That sounds a brilliant one. But actually make it smaller than that if you can, just to get the habit in there. Swapping out good, great solution. Now, I like I said, I am going to check up on you. But if you feel like actually you need more support, um, then do get in touch. I'm going to skip over this one and just very briefly talk about what I do. Um, so I'm just in the process of launching a new um, menopause program. It is not for everybody. Um, this is a really intensive three month program. It includes herbal medicine, it includes diet, lifestyle, coaching. Um, it will give you everything that you possibly need in order to know that you're tackling your menopause naturally and with gusto. Um, if you want more information about that, um, again, I'm just going to slip skip over that one. Then just um, I've got a website. Have a look at it. It would I, or come and talk to me. I'd love to hear from you. You can book a, a, a slot with me on the website, and um, it'd be really great to have a chat with you. If you're a man and clearly not suffering from menopause then I do do other things as well and have more information on my website. Now that we've had a little break and sorry, it's just a little tiny break. I'm just going to bombard you with some herbal tips as well. Now, there are a group of herbs called adaptogens and they're called adaptogens because we really like silly names in the herbal community. They help your body adapt to stress. And there's different types of adaptogens. So many of you will have heard of ginseng. Ginseng is classed as an adaptogen. And it's a really highly stimulating adaptogen. So it gives you um, a boost of energy, but it should only really be used for a short period of time. Um, there are others. There's one called Eleutherococcus, um, which is was also called Siberian ginseng. And that's also very stimulating, but it can be more gentle. So these um, herbs work on something called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal gland axis. And this is like the, the control center of your, the hormone control center of your body. And if you're suffering from stress or, and that can be physical as well as mental and emotional stress, then this system, this HPA axis goes a bit out of whack. And what they found with herbs such as Eleutherococcus is that um, it can actually um, increase physical performance. So they've done loads of studies on Russian athletes and found that taking it regularly increased physical performance. Again, it's one to take under guidance and supervision because you shouldn't really be taking these for a long time because it can mask underlying conditions if that's a problem. At the other end of the adaptogen scale is one called ashwagandha, which I think is being, being touted a lot in the press. Ashwagandha is traditionally used as a herb for convalescence and to aid sleep. So again, it works on this HPA axis, but rather than giving you lots of energy, it supports the HPA axis so that the body can help to heal itself. Um, there are loads of, of herbs, adaptogens that are being talked about at the moment. And whilst they're commonly available, I would caution against experimenting too much because you can try them and you can try poor quality versions of them and not get the effect that you're expected to get. Um, so do do ask somebody for advice. The other herb that I want to talk about is oats. Now. Oats are used herbally, and it's actually the oat straw that's used in herbal medicine. But also, this is one of those crossovers where you're talking about diet being part medicine as well. Um, oats contain something called beta-glucans, 
And what that does is it reduces the postprandial blood sugar glucose levels and reduces insulin levels. So if you're one of those people that has that mid-afternoon slump, thinking about having, or you feel really, really hungry just before lunch, thinking about having oats for breakfast, either in nice sugar-free granola or low sugar granola or um, porridge um, can be really important. Now, from a herbal medicine perspective, traditionally it's used as a mild antidepressant and for melancholy and debility and nervous exhaustion. I love looking at old, old herbals because you find out all these lovely names, um, something for melancholy. But it's also um, used especially during menopause and it can improve sleep when you're in that state where you're just too tired to sleep. Um, so think about, can you include some oats in your day? Um, oats are also a really good source of vitamin B and also a good source of complex carbohydrates. So adding oats in can tick a number of those boxes from an energy point of view. And then I think this is my last herbal one, um, is the lovely rosemary. Um, rosemary is a circulatory stimulant and nervine, so it really works on the nervous system and it's used for nervous tension and poor concentration. Now, it's a really interesting herb. It inhibits an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. Uh, I'll be testing you on that one later, which increases the amount of acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter that sends signals between cells. And what that does is improve mental alertness. Now, what's really interesting about rosemary is that you can, um, research has shown that actually the scent of rosemary can have that effect. So as a herbal medicine student, we all had rosemary essential oil. We were just putting a little bit, a little drop on our wrists and smelling it before we went into our exams to help bring around some mental alertness help stimulate our energy levels so that we can go and perform brilliantly in our exams. Um, so having a sprig of fresh rosemary on your desk would be quite nice. Um, if you're really brave, a cup of rosemary tea, um, but that is not for the faint hearted. Um, and it's also used in, in herbal medicines as well. I've thrown a huge amount of information at you. I hope it hasn't been too much. Um, if you do want to get in touch, then have some, there's my email address, connect with me on LinkedIn, um, book an appointment through my website, and I would really lo love to have a chat with you. Wow. Thank you, Victoria. That was absolutely amazing because there's so much that you've shared, Victoria. I just need to look back on the recording and actually, you know, make more, even more sense of it. So thank you. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day. Good to see you.